Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you today. This will be a familiar story to many. The resurrection is the necessary end to Jesus's story. Without it, his words are vacant and his, opponent, and, and his opponents are exonerated. With it, Jesus is vindicated, his cause and authority confirmed, and his opponents disgraced. The scripture, Matthew 28, 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene, along with the other Mary, went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel's appearance was like lightning and the angel's clothing white as snow. For fear of the angel, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So the, the women left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell Jesus' disciples. Suddenly Je Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This has been a weird week for me. Typically by Tuesday, I have figured out the music that I want to use in worship and I have a good sense of where my sermon is going to be going. Neither of those happened until Friday this week. I struggled to get a handle on what was in the way and I realized that I was feeling like it was still Holy Week. Maybe I'm a little bit Greek Orthodox or something because their Holy Week was a week later. I felt as if I was still in that space between the crucifixion and the resurrection. I'm not sure it all has to do with the waiting. All of us have been waiting for word that the shelter in place order will be lifted. All of us are waiting to be able to come together in one room, to pray together, to sing together. Truth be told, I'm not only waiting, I'm longing. I am longing to stand next to others and breathe together and sing, making harmonies together, to create together. And I long to share a sacred space and create that sacred space by being in the presence of others as we open our hearts to God. I want to know what is on the other side of this shelter in place order. I want to know when and how the order will be lifted. I want I want to know and this unknowing, this unknowing is making me feel like it's Holy Saturday, not Easter. The uncertainty, that unknowing causes its own kind of anxiety. We grieve now for what we have lost, even if it's simply the ability to sing together. We grieve now for what we fear we will lose. We don't know how bad things will get before they start to get better. It's easy for our minds to weave all kinds of scenarios and it's easy to dwell on the worst possibilities. We end up wrapping ourselves in a blanket of fear. As I sat with the realization that it felt more like Holy Saturday to me than like Easter, I considered all that God accomplished on that Holy Saturday 2,000 years ago when the disciples grieved the death of their teacher. Though the disciples didn't know it, that Saturday was pregnant with all kinds of possibilities that God was working. That Saturday was a time of transition. From the next day forward, nothing would be the same. Well, we too are at a threshold like Holy Saturday. We are standing in a doorway without permission to go outside, without really knowing what is outside. 
but thresholds are holy places. Thresholds are liminal spaces, and God loves to work in the liminal. During that time between letting go of what was and grabbing on to what will be. We see God working in the liminal space of the empty tomb. Each of the Gospels, in their own unique way, tell the story about the resurrection. In Matthew's Gospel, two women come to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. In chapter 27, Matthew tells us that these two Marys saw Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus' body. They knew which tomb was Jesus. There was no confusion. Perhaps they even saw the Roman soldiers arrive to guard the tomb to make sure that no one stole the body in an, an attempt to claim that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And interestingly, Matthew doesn't tell us that the women wanted to get into the tomb, only that they went to the tomb. Matthew says that when the women arrived, there was a great earthquake and an angel of God appeared. The experience was so frightening that the Roman guards passed out. It's almost a little comical, these manly men passing out in fright, while the women are yeah, a little scared, but they don't lose their cool. Don't be afraid, the angel tells the women, and sends them to the disciples with a message to meet up with the resurrected Jesus in Galilee. Filled with joy and fear, the women run to tell the disciples this holy message. On the way, Jesus suddenly appears to them. Greeting, he says, don't be afraid. There it is again. Don't be afraid. That admonition appears in the Bible something like 140 times. Whether the admonition is coming from an angel or Jesus, it's easier to say, don't be afraid, than it is to actually turn off fear. After all, fear has a purpose. It keeps us alive. From an evolutionary standpoint, a healthy fear response is going to be naturally selected. It's much safer to fear the tiger that might be behind that bush than to trust the tiger that is behind that bush. And sometimes the tiger isn't behind that bush, but the tiger is in the neighborhood. That's what makes the coronavirus so scary. We know it's lurking in the neighborhood. We know that it's there threatening us. Even if we don't know anyone who is sick, we know people are getting sick. And some of us do know people who are sick. My father sends me news from the retirement community where he lives with my stepmom back east. 14 residents in the nursing wing of the facility have tested positive for the coronavirus. My father and stepmother are okay so far. And that's where the fear lies for me in those two words, so far. With all the fear, it's hard to remember that this is a liminal time and that God is at work. So I'm saying it out loud again, as much for me as for you, this is a liminal time and God is at work. In the midst of all this craziness, you've probably seen the signs, at least I hope they're signs. One of the first were images from NASA showing the levels of nitrogen dioxide over China plummeting as China went into social distancing in response to the coronavirus outbreak. People in India can see the Himalayas for the first time in decades as the lockdown eases air pollution, read a headline earlier this month on CNN. And just a couple days before that, the CNN headline read, Los Angeles has notoriously polluted air, but right now it has some of the cleanest of any major city. 
Meanwhile, the air quality here in the Bay Area is markedly better with as much of a third less air pollution than a year ago. When air pollution decreases, the number of deaths related to air pollution decrease. Not only that, when air pollution decreases, lungs are stronger and so the effects of the coronavirus are lessened. Realizing this and acting on it, I think, is one of the ways that God is at work during this liminal time. And it's not just the uh, nitrogen dioxide levels that have been dropping. Carbon dioxide levels have been dropping as well. This pandemic has many lessons to teach us. Many of them are about the other crisis the world faces, the climate crisis. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day this coming Wednesday, I invite us to pay attention to these lessons. Perhaps the most basic lesson is that science is real. Science matters. You, you can't negotiate with science. The laws of physics and chemistry are the laws of physics and chemistry. Science sets the rules. We can debate how we respond to the science, but we can't debate the science. Another lesson is that we're all connected, not just us in our church community or in our neighborhoods, but all around us, all around the globe, we're connected. The pandemic is global and so is the climate crisis. Not only are we humans connected to one another, we're all connected with nature. How we treat the natural word affects our well-being. Just as we could see the pandemic coming, we can see the climate crisis coming. Both demand early aggressive action to minimize losses. The sooner we act, the less suffering there will be. We have the ability to make drastic changes very quickly. When we're sufficiently motivated, we can suspend business as usual, and come up with a new way of doing things, a way where we actually help each other. All of us are vulnerable. And because of other inequalities, some of us are more vulnerable than others. To truly address the climate crisis and the coronavirus crisis, we need to address the inequality crisis. There are forces already at work trying to push us back to business as usual. When the shelter in place order is lifted, we can, and we can return to work and shopping, vast quantities of money are going to be spent to try to hook into our fantasies and our fears, to try to get us to return to old behaviors of spending and consuming. I believe that God is at work in this liminal time. Thank God that God is at work in this liminal time, working out resurrection. If we open ourselves to the new life that God is calling forth in us individually, in us as a church, in us as a society, in us as a world, a new beginning that truly embraces life in all its abundance is possible. If we hold on to that image, if we embrace that possibility, perhaps we can respond to Jesus' invitation to not be afraid and give that invitation a strong affirmation and a resounding amen.